Hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. This is an educational channel focused on uh, shedding light on some of the great theories of everything, all-encompassing theories, magnum opuses from obscure authors, ancient philosophies that you've never heard of, and so on and so forth. Things that could enrich your life if you knew about them, but they've been suppressed have not gotten a fair shake in the marketplace of ideas um, because they are threatening to somebody who's um, a control freak and uh, doesn't want you to know about them. Uh, and today is our 387th video on Dewey B. Larson and his reciprocal system of theory. Uh, Dewey B. Larson is the author of um, some of my favorite books and um, one of my favorite theories of everything. So I've been doing a very deep dive. Uh, we, um, you know, I can't claim to be an expert on Mr. Larson's theory. I'm just a student, like hopefully all of you will become. And uh, so I do a lot of verbatim reading of his books and articles and uh, some of his followers um, with uh, limited analysis uh, from my uh, standpoint. If I have something to chime in, I try to, but uh, a lot of times I just try to let it speak for itself uh, so that you can um, be the judge. Uh, but I do recommend that you uh, don't be judgmental and uh, you let the information wash over you and then um, later on uh, you can kind of uh, marinate the ideas and uh, decide uh, over time uh, once you've had enough exposure. I would say that uh, you really can't get a flavor of Larson's theory, uh, reciprocal system of theory, until you've uh, had a look at several of his works um, because if you if you don't know if you don't have a broad range of uh, his subject matter um, it it can sound like he's he's just pulling stuff out of no place and that he's just making stuff up um, but then if you if you have a broad range and you can see that he's actually being very consistent and that he's actually using the same uh, thing that he pulled out uh, of it, you know, seems like he pulled it out of his elbow one time, but, and you're thinking, oh, well, he just is using this because it, it helps his theory right, right here. But he uses the exact same thing, um, you know, in another uh, unrelated, um, seemingly unrelated context uh, later on in a different book. And then he uses the same thing later in another book. You can see that he's actually being consistent and he's not just kind of uh, cherry picking, um, you know, things that work for a particular, you know, set of, um, you know, set of circumstances. Now, the basic gist behind the reciprocal system of theory, Larson was an, an engineer who lived in the 20th century, born in 1898, died in 1990, and um, he uh, basically, you know, took about 25, 30 years to develop his ideas along these lines, but in the late 1950s put out his two fundamental postulates, and these were two uh, very short, um, basically two sentences uh, that kind of try to encapsulate his whole theory. And then he took those two postulates and from them, uh, through a process of deduction, he derived a theoretical universe. Okay, basically saying, well, if my two postulates are correct, this is what my universe would look like. And then so he took his theoretical universe, which I've documented in his, uh, by going over his paper that he gave called The Outline of the Deductive Development of the Reciprocal System. 
and that was about 15 videos that I did approximately one year ago. And um, so if you want to go back and check those, uh, you can see the kind of evolution of Larson's thinking. And then uh, he took his theoretical universe and he compared it in his books to the uh, observed and measured and documented and compiled uh, universe that the legacy scientists have, um, you know, built up over time. Basically, scientific tables, uh, you know, tables of uh, various atomic properties of the elements and compounds, uh, uh, listings of um, characteristics and qualities of stars and galaxies in the ast astronomical world. Uh, weights and measures of, you know, um, theoretical particles of, you know, atomic constituents and so on. And uh, it's quite amazing when he does that, that he's able to come up with these same answers strictly from theory, strictly from his head and, you know, the, his deductions from those postulates, he's able to come up with the same uh, basic tables, recreate the tables that these scientists, uh, armies of scientists over centuries uh, at the expense of mil billions and maybe even trillions of dollars um, were able to compile. So... Uh, I think that is enough to trigger a systematic investigation. Not saying that he's completely right. I mean, you know, it could be fraud. It could be all kinds of other things that could explain that. But um, I think it's worth looking into. The basic idea in the uh, fundamental postulates, uh, mainly the first postulate being the most important, is that... Uh, we don't live in a universe of matter, and we don't live in a universe of energy. We don't live in a universe uh, based on the fundamental forces of nature. We live in a universe made out of motion, in particular a kind of motion that Larson calls scalar motion, which is a motion that has a magnitude but has no specific direction, uh, which you can envision using a balloon with dots on it, if you blow up the balloon, all of the dots are moving away from each other, but they're not moving in any specific direction. They are just moving away from each other. The further they are away from each other, the faster they're moving away from each other. And this is a model of uh, really the expansion of space or what Larson refers to as clock space. Um, a scalar motion in space. This corresponds with clock time. Uh, space is always getting farther and farther and farther apart. In clock time, time is always getting later and later and later and later. Just like the motion of a clock. The clock is always getting later and later, but it's not getting later in a specific direction. Or it's getting later in all directions. And um, so the universe is made out of this specific kind of motion, scalar motion. And motion is the relationship between space and time. Which means that space and time are reciprocals of one another. Basically, motion is a fraction with space or time as the numerator and time or space as the denominator. All of our scientific quantities that we know of, force and acceleration and matter and energy and um, electric charge and magnetic flux and electrical capacitance and pressure and viscosity and fluidity and... Um, surface tension and power. These are all 
relationships between space and time. And uh, sometimes you have time with uh, an exponent of two or three, or space with an exponent of two or three, or even four or five, or in the case of density, six. Um, but um, they are relationships between space and time. Uh, so space and time as reciprocals of each other have a couple other important um, you know, consequences. Uh, space and time are identical to each other, except that they are reciprocals. So they have the same qualities, but basically have them in a different order. Um, and uh, space and time as reciprocals of each other, um, they both multiply to get one. And um, Larson refers to what he calls coordinate time and coordinate space. Uh, coordinate space is what we see in space, generally what we observe. Three dimensions of space, X, Y, Z coordinates or volume in a stationary frame. And so Larson uh, extrapolates that time also has those same qualities because space and time are reciprocals. And so time also has its coordinate aspect, three dimensions of stationary, uh, in a stationary frame of time, coordinate time. So there's clock space and clock time, coordinate space and coordinate time. And then also, space and time both come only in discrete units. They are quantized. There is a minimum unit of space and a minimum unit of time. You have to have a full unit before you have anything. And if you have one unit of space in one unit of time, you have the speed of light. And the speed of light is what Larson calls unit speed. One over one equals one. And uh, this unit speed is the background motion of the reciprocal system. So in the, in the reciprocal system, if you have a, uh, an empty galaxy or an empty universe with nothing in it, you still have motion outward at the speed of light in all directions, a scalar motion in all directions at the speed of light. That is what Larson calls the progression of the natural reference system. And uh, that... Uh, goes against the legacy science who measures from a zero reference point, from zero motion. Larson measures from unit motion, just like a reciprocal. Uh, in an additive system, you measure from zero, plus or minus zero, plus or, you know, plus one or minus one, plus two or minus two, plus three or minus three. But with reciprocals, it's one that is at the center, and it's a multiplicative system. You can go, you know, plus would be two, and minus would be one half. Plus would be three, and minus would be one third. Plus would be four, and minus would be one fourth. They multiply to, to be one, but they are um, balanced, just like an um, additive system. So the progression of the natural reference system changes things and uh, basically creates an entire sector of the universe that the legacy scientists don't know anything about. Uh, Einstein said that uh, the speed of light is the maximum speed of the universe. In Larson's system, the speed of light is the midpoint of the universe. And uh, he calls it the null point, the neutral point, the origin, the ether, the, uh, the progression of the natural reference system, um, the zero point. Uh, the zero point is one. And uh, half of the universe is moving faster than the speed of light, which uh, Larson refers to as the cosmic sector. And even though the material, uh, even though the legacy scientists don't know anything about the cosmic sector, they can catch up because what is going on in the cosmic sector is identical to what's going on in the material sector. 
except that the roles of space and time are reversed. So uh, in the material sector, you have coordinate space, three dimensions of uh, in a stationary uh, reference frame, and you have clock time. The, cl the clock is progressing. It's always getting later and later and later. Uh, in the cosmic sector, you have coordinate time, three dimensions of time in a stationary frame. And you have clock space, the progression of space. Space is always getting farther and farther and farther apart. Okay, now today we're going to start a new article written by a Larson. This was actually a talk he gave back in 1979 um, that was called uh, Science Without Apologies. And uh, here it goes. In a well-known Gilbert and Sullivan opera, a member of the constabula uh, constabulary uh, undergoes some rather trying experiences in the course of carrying out his duties and finally breaks into song, telling us that, quote, a policeman's lot is not a happy one. In many respects, the lot of those who undertake to correct existing errors in any field of thought is similar to that of a policeman. There is no problem in the case of someone who simply makes a discovery in a new area. Both the scientific community and the world at large are ready to welcome a genuine addition to knowledge with some degree of enthusiasm, and they are willing to look tolerantly on any speculation that is not specifically in conflict with established thought even if it involves something that strains credulity to the utmost. A black hole, for example. But long-standing problems in science or in any other field are seldom, if ever, resolved by new discoveries because their continued existence is almost always due to some errors in existing thought. Any major or basic advance in understanding requires a significant modification of existing ideas. And this, like the policeman's efforts to enforce the law, is definitely unwelcome. Most individuals tend to regard an attack on one of their cherished ideas of long standing in the same way as an attack on one of their children and they react just as emotionally. Obtaining a solution for a major problem is therefore not an end in itself. It is only the beginning of a long and difficult struggle. Many investigators are not willing to subject themselves to this kind of an ordeal, and their discoveries have to be made all over again years or decades or even centuries later. In the classic case of Gregor Mendel, genetic science stood still for 30 years until Mendel's findings were rediscovered. J.J. Waterston developed the kinetic theory, but dropped it when his paper was rejected by the Royal Society as nonsense, and his work, too, had to be repeated years later in another country. Max Planck, one of the giants of modern science, encountered the same kind of a reception. He was not an, uh, so easily discouraged and ultimately defeated his critics, but he was very bitter about the long battles that he had to fight to get recognition of his findings. He finally arrived at the conclusion, often quoted in the scientific literature, that new ideas never convince their opponents and have to wait until they die off and a new generation takes over. No one knows how many valuable findings have been lost because of the kind of a reception that they have encountered, since only the exceptional cases ever come to our attention. But they are no doubt very numerous, particularly in the non-scientific disciplines where little progress has been made toward agreement on criteria by which to distinguish between valid and invalid conclusions. It is rather sobering to reflect on the possibility that many of the problems that afflict modern society may have been solved long ago by investigators whose results have been ignored. 
In any event, the point that I intend to emphasize is that in the new system of physical theory that I propose to, di uh, to discuss, the reciprocal system of theory, as we call it, we have a science that requires no apologies. It is generally not realized that science has any need for apology, as matters now stand. Uh, physical science is so far ahead of other fields of thought that it might seem as if we ought to be patting ourselves on the back rather than apologizing. But we should realize that no other field of thought has had our advantages. No other has had the combination of a wealth of easily accessible data and 3,000 years of systematic study of that data. Consequently, we cannot legitimately judge our present standing on the basis of what others have done. We will have to judge it on the basis of how well we have used the advantages that the others have lacked. I do not intend to make such a judgment, but I do have to call attention to the way in which so many of the most prominent scientists of our time are going about apologizing right and left. For example, Richard Feynman finds it necessary to apologize for the basic weakness of present-day scientific thought, the lack of a theory of general application. He describes the situation in this way, quote, Today our theories of physics, the laws of physics, are a multitude of different parts and pieces that do not fit together very well. We do not have one structure from which all is deduced, end quote. This is an apology. Dr. Feynman realizes that after 3,000 years, we should have, quote, one structure from which all is deduced, end quote. But the apology is even more evident in the statement that follows the first one quoted, uh, quote, Instead of having the ability to tell you what the law of physics is, I have to talk about the things that are common to the various laws. We do not understand the connections between them. End quote. A significant consequence of this lack of a general theory is an inability to arrive at an understanding of the most fundamental scientific entities and phenomena. In fact, a complete understanding of these fundamental entities would be a general theory. Gravitation is an outstanding example. According to R.H. Dick, quote, it may well be most fundamental and least un the most fundamental and least understood of the interactions. Dean E. Woldridge gives us this assessment, quote, but what is gravity, really? What causes it? Where does it come from? How did it get started? The scientist has no answers. In a fundamental sense, it is still as mysterious and inexplicable as it ever was, and it seems destined to remain so. End quote. This, too, is an apology. An apology for the inability of present-day science to account for what is conceded to be one of the most basic of all physical phenomena. A very conspicuous weakness of current science is its inability to keep up with the observational and experimental progress along the frontiers of science, the realms of the very small, the very large, and the very fast. One of these fields in which experimental knowledge is currently advancing at a rapid rate is the physics of high energies. V. E. Weisskopf makes this observation about the corresponding theoretical progress. Quote, it is questionable whether our present understanding of high energy phenomena is commensurate to the intellectual effort directed at their interpretation. Here again, End quote. Here again is an apology, an apology for the backwardness of the theoretical undertaking. Dr. Weisskopf is, in effect, telling us that we are not getting our money's worth out of the use that we are making of current physical theory. The prevailing situation in astronomy is similar. Okay, I think I'm going to stop right there, and we'll get into the, the theory in astronomy next time out. Um, 
And uh, so we'll be starting this up here tomorrow. I uh, hope you can come back. Oh, actually, I'm going faster than I thought. I've got a couple more minutes. Let's keep going. Sorry, <laughs> I've read the clock wrong there. The prevailing situation in astronomy is similar. Here the observers find themselves confronted with a whole range of newly discovered phenomena that they cannot understand on the basis of present day physics. Martin Harwit describes the situation in these terms, quote, the fundamental nature of astrophysical discoveries being made or remaining to be made leaves little room for doubt but that a large part of current theory will have to be drastically revised over the next decades. Much of what is known today must be regarded as tentative, and all parts of the field have to be viewed with healthy skepticism." End quote. Fred Hoyle, one of the most prominent astronomers of our day, has been even more critical. He speaks of the, quote, total inadequacy of current physical theory to meet the astronomical requirements. These statements by Harwood and Hoyle are worded as criticisms, but the individuals from whom they emanate are not only astronomers, they are also astrophysicists. In fact, Harwood specifically states that he is talking about astrophysics. Such criticisms of the current thinking of a profession by members of that profession are, in a very real sense, apologies. Similar calls for a new kind of physics are now being heard from all directions. Richie Calder, uh, for instance, says that the energy problem in astronomy quote, cannot in any case be explained in terms of conventional physical theory. Some kind, end quote, some kind of physics, some new kind of physics uh, seems to be needed. Uh, that's another quote, uh, says an item of, uh, in the British journal, The New Scientist. Simon Mitten tells us that, quote, it is believed by some that the final solution will only come after astronomers have rewritten some of the laws of fundamental physics, end quote. I have a large collection of comments of this nature. As a general summary, the following statement by E.R. Harrison may be of interest. Quote, it is not inconceivable that in the future our ideas on the nature of space, time, and gravity on the cosmic scale will be entirely different from current ideas. The most significant result that will follow it, as we contend, the new physical theory that I am discussing here is a correct representation of the actual physical universe. The consequence that should cause everyone to hope that it is correct is that the need for such apologies will respect, uh, with respect to the fundamentals of science will be eliminated. Science will not need to apologize for the lack of theory of general application because the reciprocal system is a general physical theory. Science will not need to apologize for a lack of understanding of the basic entities and phenomena of the universe because the reciprocal system provides such an understanding. Science will not need to apologize for the inability of its theoretical structure to keep up with the progress of experiment and observation, because the reciprocal system is not only abreast of empirical progress, but well ahead of it in many areas. It will, of course, be impossible for me to develop the structure of this theory in any substantial detail in the relatively short space that is available. Here I want to show just how the new theoretical development overcomes the difficulties that have led to the apologetic statements that I've just quoted. And then take a look at some of the new answers that it supplies for old problems. Okay, now we will stop there and uh, get on with this uh, next time. So. 
um, you know, Larson kind of went through all of the apologies that scientific uh, people have to give for their lack of success in various fields. Um, and now he's going to propose his alternative and how it uh, avoids those problems. And um, hence the title of his paper, Science Without Apologies. We'll get into that tomorrow. Thanks for tuning in today. Have a great day.